1982 and 1924, about 22 million, 22,500,000 immigrants came to the United States. Now this country had grown during those years from about 52 million people just after the Civil War uh, to around 114 or so million people. That's a growth of 61 million people during 40 years. Uh, putting it another way, that's about 116 percent growth. In other words, the country more than doubled its population in 40 years. And of this growth, 20 percent of the growth was immigration, at least. Another way to think of this and its immense impact on America is to think about America today. There are about 330 million Americans today. Based on the same ratio of immigrants, if we had about 20 percent immigration today, that would be 66 million people. Can you imagine what that would do to our country? And we worry about 10 million or 10,000 people coming in every year. That gives you some idea of the difference and the impact of this immigration. It was accentuated, this mass immigration was accentuated by several trends in America during these years. First of all, America was becoming an urban civilization. After the Civil War during the 1870s and early 80s, farming was the basis of America. Farming and on the western frontier, ranching. But during the 1880s and 90s, cities began to grow very quickly. Most of the immigrants ended up in sections of various American cities. And so the Lower East Side of New York, Dorchester, Massachusetts, uh, different places had different communities of immigrants. In addition, uh, industrial factory work did not require the same kind of skills that had previously been used by craft workers. If you were making something uh, by yourself, you needed to be very skilled. But factory workers did repetitive work over and over and over. And so the immigrant could move into the factory and sometimes displaced American workers. In addition, there had been a serious depression in 1873 and there were periodic downturns of the economy that accentuated the uh, distress that some people felt in America and in their economic futures. There was also a redistribution of power after the Civil War. The, S the South had been devastated. Sherman's march through the South meant that there were large areas of the South that had been destroyed and of course huge numbers of young men had been killed or wounded. So the South was no longer as powerful in America as it used to be. In addition, transportation by railroad grew very quickly, so they no longer had to depend on river transportation. And the rivers uh, in the North uh, were much less important than the railroads. So the North had industrial and transportation capabilities that it, no long, that it did not have before. Finally, there was a group of people who became extraordinarily rich, the oligarchs, if you will, of American industry. And uh, so the steel tycoons, the railroad tycoons, the builders and the shakers of America were almost all in the North. This caused some sexual rivalries and uh, anxieties, especially in the South. These new immigrants were very different from the Northern European immigrants who had come earlier. And they provoked 
a kind of reaction in America which was essentially racist. People did not like these new kinds of immigrants. They came from the Slavic countries of Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Albania, from Greece, from Turkey. They came from the Mediterranean, large numbers of Italians. <clears throat> there were people from the Orient, from China especially, and black Caribbeans, and of course Eastern European people. And what, one of the things we find in American academe at that time is racism and pseudoscientific theories about how different races of people had different kinds of capabilities and potentials. And generally speaking, these racist theories prompted the idea that the white Anglo Northern European worker and person was more capable and brighter and better than people from other areas. Uh, there is even a notion of the shape of the head. People called it phrenology and they would actually try to touch the head and see the shape of the head and if you had a particular shape, if your nose was longer, if your eyes were slanted, if your chin went back a little bit, whatever it was, these physical characteristics were then associated with psychological and character characteristics. And so you could, you, you wouldn't trust, of course, somebody whose chin receded. That was a sure sign these, these phony scientists felt that somebody was crooked or devious. America did not like the Jewish immigrants at this time. It was not a good time for any immigrant to come. And part of this feeling was occasioned by a scholar named Frederick Jackson Turner, who was an historian at the University of Wisconsin. In 1893, he published a paper which he read at the American Historical Society in Chicago. And the paper was called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. And what Jackson Turner said was that up until about 1890 or so, the frontier had been wide open and could act as a safety valve to siphon off people from the eastern cities. But around 1893 or 1890, the frontier was essentially full. And it was no longer possible for that frontier mentality to serve as the guarantor of American security. And uh, there was no room for people to move into the frontier. Now he's of course wrong. And there's been a huge debate ever since about Turner's thesis. But what it did was it scared a lot of people and stoked fears that had arisen perhaps for other reasons. People were racist, but now they had uh, something to hold on to. They said, we're stuck with all these people. We can't get rid of them because we can't move to the frontier and we can't send them to the frontier. And so they're stuck in these urban ghettos. It's going to be terrible. Out of this period comes American nativism and a very strong anti-immigration sentiment and movement. Now there were three historic visions of American society. The first, which lasted until the 18, uh, until the Civil War really, was what we would call Anglo-centrism. Anglo-centrism means that if you come to America, the way to become an American is to end up imitating the Anglo community. To become an American, you have to become one of them. And no matter where you start, 
your goal ought to be to become part of the Anglo civilization. The second theory, which was after the Civil War, was the melting pot theory. Now, it uh, takes the point of view that all of these immigrants and all Americans are sort of put into one big pot, melted down, and out of that pot comes the ideal American. Turns out the ideal American looks very much like the earlier Anglo. The ideal American is what it used to be, but is now composed of immigrants as well. Somewhere around early 20th century, two scholars, John Dewey and Horace Callan, who taught at the New School for Social Research in New York, came up with a theory of cultural pluralism. And their model was the patchwork quilt, that all of the different groups in America are part of the same fabric, but they also keep their identity. And they're sewed together like pieces of a patchwork quilt, like squares on a quilt. And they are able to uh, make America richer by virtue of this diversity. In a sense, that's what we call cultural pluralism today. And it's sort of the model that most Americans subscribe to today. Immigration had always stirred some negative feelings. And even in the 1840s and 50s, there were anti-immigrant groups. But beginning in the 1890s, this movement of anti-immigration was much stronger. There was what we would call xenophobia. Xenophobia is a hatred of somebody who is a foreigner, different, an immigrant. And nativism, the desire to keep the society as it used to be. Remember, all of these people who are being displaced into cities have this sort of nostalgia for the perfect life that they allegedly led when they were out on the farmland. This pure America. And here it is becoming corrupted and destroyed by this horde of immigrants from parts of the world that they don't like in the first place. So there were early efforts to limit immigration. The first efforts were to uh, exclude people who might in some way become public charges. So contract laborers, people who were brought in for a limited kind of time, especially Asians to work on the railroads in the West, uh, and, and then allegedly were going to be sent home, they wanted to stop that in the first place. They wanted to stop people who could not read or write, illiterates, people who had criminal backgrounds, or who had participated in revolutionary movements. These were dangerous folks. They wanted to exclude immoral people, immoral defined by the standards of 1900-1910. Certainly they wanted to keep out people with diseases. And if you look at pictures of Ellis Island, you will see inspectors looking at immigrants and checking their eyes, especially for the disease of trachoma. And if you had trachoma, you might be sent back. So the steamship companies were responsible for screening people in Europe because if they brought them to America and they were excluded, they had to be taken back at the cost of the steamship companies. So the idea was to stop them before they ever got on the ship in the first place. And of course, anybody who was a pauper, somebody who had no resources, was likely to be a public charge. And of course, we didn't want those folks because we didn't want to pay for them. The screening eventually happened on Ellis Island. 
And the pictures of large scale groups of people getting off a boat, being transported from the steamship by ferry to Ellis Island, and then spending perhaps a day in uh, the big hall there, the reception hall, where inspectors would check them, check their documents, and admit those who were admissible and screen out those that they couldn't accept. Sometimes there were people who had temporary problems, uh, uh, colds or flu or something like that, and they kept them for a few days. The screening process was pretty brutal. People who had every reason to think that they could come to America because they had passed through the screening in Europe were then excluded. And sometimes it was done on the basis of race and other times on the basis of disabilities. This entire process culminated in 1924. There was an Immigration Act. It was sponsored by two people, Congressman Albert Johnson, who was from Washington State, and Senator David Reed from the state of Pennsylvania. And it was eventually signed by President Calvin Coolidge. Now, the 1921 Immigration Act had established a temporary a quota based on nationality of about 358,000 people per year. Now, what is, a qual what is a quota based on nationality? So many people from each country were allowed in under this quota. So many Germans, so many Scandinavians or Swedes, Norwegians, British, French, Russians, so on. In 1924, the act made this system permanent and it reduced the annual quota from 358,000 to 164,000. It reduced the percentage of what could be coming in for each nationality group. Now, how did they figure this? They took the United States Census and they found out how many people listed, let's say, Germany as their native land. And of those, they then assigned a percentage. The 1921 Act had said 3%. The 1924 Act cut it down to 2%. But this was something very sneaky, in a sense. Which census did they use? They could have used the 1920 census, which was already available. They didn't. They used the 1890 census, which had been taken before mass immigration really hit America. And so the, the imbalance between these undesirable nations and the desirable nations was accentuated. There were more people from Western Europe percentage-wise in the 1890 census than from Eastern Europe. It would have been different if they'd taken 1920. And so the quota for uh, Western and Northern Europe did reduce by about 29 percent, but the quota for Southern and Eastern Europe dropped by 87 percent. You know, there's about three times as much. It was a deliberate effort to discriminate against the kinds of people that the movers and shakers of America, the Anglo folks, did not want to come into this country. No Arabs and no Asians were allowed at all. Few Jews, Italians, and Greeks. Mexicans were only admitted as farm laborers. And so the golden door that Emma Lazarus had written about on the Statue of Liberty, that door slammed shut. From 1924 
until 1947. Only about 2,700,000 immigrants were accepted into America, and that's the same number as any two years before World War I. So the immigration really tapered off completely. The result was that the American population was no longer so lively and affected by groups of immigrants, and instead it became much more homogeneous. Since World War II, we have had a small immigration. There have been displaced persons after World War II, refugees from Nazi oppression, Hungarians in 1956 and 7 who fled the revolution in Hungary, some Israelis, some people from Arab lands who fled various kinds of totalitarian groups, and a few others. But the numbers of, immigration, of immigrants now are relatively small compared to what we saw in earlier days. So America in the, eight, in the 1920s went through a spasm, a paroxysm of anti-immigration feeling, and it really stopped the large-scale migration. And this was a reaction to the mass immigration of the previous 40 years.